Um, I'm going to um, talk today about friendship in young people with autism and really reinforce some of the, um, um, the messages that Neil um, um, sent in his, in his presentation, but also hopefully build on them as well. Um, I want, I'm going to talk about a study that we did with a doctoral student of mine who was an educational, um, who's doing a doctor in educational psychology in a local authority in London. Um, and I want to talk to you about it, not just because I think it's a good study, but because also um, it really raised some ethical issues for me that I think are really uh, difficult um, uh, uh, or challenging, but I think we still need to kind of um, th or think about them um, and, yeah, and try and tackle them. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through the study itself um, uh, on friendship in autistic children attending mainstream schools. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get us to consider some of the social and ethical issues that are raised by these, the, the data, the, the results, um, regarding when and how to intervene with these young people. Um, and I'm not going to give you really, really concrete suggestions, but I'm going to um, suggest maybe how um, we might move forward. So we all know that you know, friendships are, are hugely important in our lives. And we know this, but there are studies showing that, um, that friendships and social connections promote mental health. And for, even for individuals with neuropsychiatric conditions, they um, improve well-being and they improve outcomes. And in fact, enjoying stable, long-lasting and reciprocal friendships is held to be one of the hallmarks of a good adult outcome. So those autistic individuals who have friends, who have social relationships and connections, um, do better in life, um, according, uh, um, according to us, um, than those people who don't have such connections. But autism itself is defined, in terms of the current diagnostic criteria, by a failure to develop peer relationships appropriate to developmental level. And so I think this, this criterion itself serves to reinforce the belief or the stereotype, really, that autistic people cannot form friendships or, do, or don't want to at all form friendships. So we've got this idea that, you know, they can't, they, they, that friendship is crucial to um, a good adult outcome, but, you know, autistic people, um, uh, it's part of the diagnosis of autism to not be able to ha have or make friends. Um, so what does that mean for people with autism? But we know that autistic people, or autistic children and adolescents, seek out their non-autistic peers. They report having friends and best friends. And they, and they do report having a desire for friends um, and to be involved with other children in their class. Um, and Neil's work, um, which you've just heard about, um, um, emphasizes that you know, making and keeping friends plays a significant role in, um, in children's overall experience of school just as it does for typical children. So, so despite the kind of stereotype that children with autism don't want to form friendships or cannot form friendships, we know actually from research that they, they, do, they do often want um, um, friends. But I don't think we yet quite fully understand um, how, to, how autistic children perceive friends. Um, so what is the precise functional role um, of friendships um, for them, so whether they perceive friendships in the same way as typically developing children do. And I also don't think we know what their experiences of friendship are and, and their satisfaction with their friendships and peer interactions. And also the, the sorts of factors that might influence the, their peer relationships. So we set out to do a study to try and look at all those things. Um, I'm not sure you can see that very well. Um, to, to, to do a systematic investigation of the friendship experiences of a group of um, cognitively able autistic children um, who were educated within um, mainstream schools in London. So these, is, um, these are the kids we saw. Uh, we saw 12 autistic children, eight of whom were boys, and 11 non-autistic peers of similar age and ability, um, so they were all of at least average intellectual functioning, from nine different year five and six mainstream classrooms in one London borough. Um, and this might, uh, this is you know, a reasonably small group compared to the hundreds of children that Neil was talking about, but um, we got a lot of data from these kids. So we, um, we, taught, we, got, um, we got them to rate their friendship experiences using a questionnaire, we interviewed them, and we did social network, networking methods as well with them. 
but not only with the kids themselves, also with their parents, with their teachers, and with their non-autistic peers or their classroom peers. So the first kind of question we asked was, how were the children with autism included in these classrooms? And we did this by using social network methods, which are actually really cool. So these are methods where we ask the children with autism and their classmates to write down the groups of friends in your class and think about who plays together in the classroom at playtime and at lunch times. So this is a really kind of sensitive way of it kind of voids, it voids the, um, uh, the more direct question would be, you know, who does the autistic child play with in your classroom? Um, this is a kind of a, a less um, direct way of, of getting at that. But what we, do, what we did was we, we got all the, the children's nominations and we put them all together and that provided a social map of, 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 of the social networks in those classes, so who plays with who in those classrooms. And I've just got an example of one social um, map so this is, this is quite unique because this, this classroom actually had three children with autism in this particular class, so this was a bit unusual. But this is the kind of map, the map that emerged from you know, asking the question, who, who, do, who do the children play with? So here you've got, you've got Caitlin here and Zane and Lucy, so they're the children with autism. Um, and you can see, I hope, that Caitlin and Zane are really connected in, in to, to, the, to their social groups. They're high status social groups because there's a lot of people in those groups. Um, and Caitlin and Zane are well connected to them. Lucy, on the other hand, is what we might call on the periphery of social networks. So she's only connected to a single child um, in the class. Um, so there's lots of even in this one classroom, there's lots of variability here. You've got children who are quite nuclear or kind of central to social networks, and then a child who's on the periphery. And this is just an example from one classroom, but across all the nine classrooms, um, there was this kind of, you know, there was, oh, this is about autism generally, but there was this sense of much variability in, in degree um, of their social inclusion. And so all I've got here is this is the individual children, all 12 children with autism. And this here shows the degree of kind of the connectedness to social networks. So I hope you can see there were, there were a few children who were really central, but most of the children were secondary, so it goes, it goes nucleus, um, secondary, then peripheral, and then isolated. So most of the children were, um, were, were, were considered to be um, um, secondary in terms of their connectedness or on the periphery of social networks. What I think is quite encouraging is that none of these children were socially isolated. So they were always thought to be connected to another child in the class. And actually that's quite interesting because there were a lot of other children in the different classrooms who, who were socially isolated, who, but who weren't autistic. Um, and here in the middle, we've got, I've got um, the percentage of reciprocated friendships. So basically this is, you know, if I say that this is my friend, it's that person also says that I'm their friend. Um, and again, there's lots of variability. I think there'd be lots of variability in the typical kids too. But you can see here that, you know, children with autism, there, there are, you know, high percentages of, of reciprocated friendships in those classrooms as well. But there is lots of variability. The second question we asked was how did children rate their friendships? So how did, how did children understand or perceive even the notion of what a friend is? Um, and to do this, um, we used a questionnaire that has been used in kind of lots of um, studies with typical children and with children with autism called the Friendships, Friendship Quality Scale. It has about 45 questions and we went through them individually with each child. Um, and this just gives you an example of some of the questions. So um, for this one here, it's my friend and I spend a lot of our free time together. And that's kind of reflective of this, uh, this notion of companionship. So friends being someone you want to hang out with, you want to play with. Um, then there's conflict. So my friend and I disagree about many things. That's just kind of recognising that conflict can occur in friendships. Um, and then the other categories are help, security and closeness. Closeness in particular is interesting because it, this is this idea of this emotional or affective bond with another person. So an example question for here is, if my friend had to move away, I would miss him or her. So children rated these on a, on a, very, on a scale, so whether they, agree, were they, were they strongly agreed, agreed, they thought it was okay or disagreed. Um, and what we found was that um, on three of the uh, kind of categories, um, children with autism were just as um, 
um, or, or, or rated the, their friendships um, similarly to typically developing children. But on the two measures, there's one here on the health category, but particularly the closeness category, they, um, they essentially they rated their, their friendships as less kind of helpful um, and less close. So they, they, they kind of reflect this um, lack of emotional, emotional connectedness with their friends. And this was reflected in our interviews as well. So the next kind of question we asked was, what did children um, with autism say about their friendships? So we got them to rate, obviously, in this questionnaire, but then we wanted to know, we wanted to really in depth, get really rich descriptions about what they actually thought about friendships. And the first theme um, that emerged from the data were, um, was this notion as a friend, as a companion. So when we asked children, you know, what does the fr being a friend mean to you? They would say things like, they always play with me, someone that you hang around with, we like being together, we play games with each other. And this really, um, this is qualitatively different from the kind of responses that typically developing children or non-autistic children would give. Um, so typically developing children usually talk about kind of emotional connectedness, a kind of almost an intimacy really with friends. Some children did do that. So again, this is this variability. Um, so some children's descriptions did kind of talk about these effective aspects or dimensions of friendship. So one child said, being a friend is someone who cares for you and protects you when someone is picking on you. So this is like, you know, help, there's this helpness, the, the help quality there and the effective quality. But others didn't at all. So this is one quote from a, a, one of the girls. Well, my best best friend is going to be moving soon, and my second best friend, she won't be moving, so I can always play with her. And the other girl said, I helped them once, and they were so kind, I thought, well, yeah, he's my friend. So the, again, it's this kind of the notion of just kind of hanging out, or having someone to chat with, or, ha or chat to, or having someone to play with. So that was the first theme. And that first theme um, was reinforced by, by what parents and what teachers said about these children's friendships. So parents um, um, told us that their autistic children's friendships tended to be different in some way. Um, so someone, again, someone to hang out with what, rather than someone to bond with. Um, and they also seem to say that you know, generally they perceive, the, they perceive their children to be on the periphery of social networks in the classrooms rather than kind of fully included. The teachers, um, you know, teachers told us that their children were generally liked um, in, by their classmates, but they weren't necessarily chosen as a friend. So one teacher says, you know, I don't think they dislike him, but I don't think he's their first choice. Um, and uh, often the children were perceived to require befriending, so they had to get another friend, another child in the class to befriend the child. Um, and these, the children, the autistic children were either tolerated or they were accepted um, um, by, by the kind of befriender and also the non-autistic peers. So you've got this kind of qualitatively different um, um, understanding or, um, yeah, of friendship in these children. So friends as companions. The second theme to emerge um, was the challenges of friendship. Um, so all but one, this, and this is quite interesting, all of the, so all but one child in our sample was satisfied with the nature and degree of their friendships. Um, and this, uh, despite this kind of general satisfaction, they noted how confusing friendships can be. So one um, little boy said, well, this may be a little weird, but I don't know if I have friends or not. I don't know if children like me or I like them. Other children noted their preference for being alone, and that's something I'll come back to later. Others talked about kind of the feelings of social exclusion, so being abnormal. Um, and others also talked about instances of conflict. So one little girl said, they talk in their private little groups and I'm not in it. I don't really care. I don't mind if they do that. Actually, I get a bit upset. Um, so clearly, you know, they, ha they, they do have many challenges in their kind of day-to-day -day peer interactions. The third theme, and this was, I think, particularly, um, this isn't 
these themes kind of emerged from our conversations. We didn't necessarily prompt parents or teachers or the children themselves to talk about these themes. Um, so th and this is one that kind of just emerged all on its own. So this is completely unprompted. Um, this children's motivation to make and keep friends. And again, this varied enormously in this sample. So this is one little boy. Um, sometimes I've got nobody. The two boys play with the two girls. I try to watch. I want more friends because there are no new people in the class. Only new people be my friend. And the other people don't want to be my friend. And you know, Henry's it's really, it's really quite sad. Um, but it's um, he's he's one of the only he's one of, he was the only child to be dissatisfied with his friendships. So he clearly wants to make you know, wants to be with a, a, or have friends, but doesn't quite negotiate that particularly well. At least to to, to properly sustain friendships. And then we've got James, and James is interesting because he was one of, he's a, what we would call peripherally um, socially connected, so he was connected to only one other child in one class. But he says, I'm happy with my life right now. I'm not friendly and talkative, but I'm not not friendly. I'm somewhere in the middle. So you've got this, I hope that kind of these, just these quotes really just show, illustrate the kind of variability in children's motivations to even just want to have friends. And in some respects, it kind of um, reflects the variability in, in the non-autistic population. You know, some of us do want lots and lots of friends, and others of us just don't. Um, so it's not necessarily variability that's autism-specific. And again, the parents and teachers agreed with the children. So, um, so some the parents um, told us about their children's preference for being alone. So um, this comes from a you know, parent. I think if he had a choice, he would probably choose to play by himself mostly. And then a teacher, he doesn't seek out other children and would much rather play on his own or with an adult. And one other parent noted that her child was uninterested in friendship completely. So he, he was all, he's always been a little bit less interested in friends and is more in his own bubble. So there are definitely, and there are other children like Caitlin, who was the kind of, you know, um, really quite central to her um, social network. She, you know, she wanted, you completely wanted to have friends and, and, and connections with her peers. So there's, again, there's this huge variability, and the parents and the teachers are well aware of this variability. They're well aware and they, they are supportive. So parents are obviously supportive, but um, teachers are themselves supportive as well. So this is a teacher about Daniel. If he, was all, if he was always on his own, there'd be an issue. But I think sometimes he needs alone time to organise his thoughts. So really kind of sensitive to his, you know, to his need there. And then a teacher about James. Sometimes an adult gives them, other children, a reminder to invite the children into their games. So it's possible that they do not invite him into their games as much as they should, but I'm constantly reminding them as I go through the playground. And so she was, um, and there were other teachers in, in, the, in the sample who often talked about their kind of their teaching assistants. They would often get them out into the um, playground and make sure that the, the autistic child were interacting with other children in the class or in, in, the, in the playground. So there is this supportive role. <coughs> and parents again respond to this variability. Um, so this is what the parent about Caitlin. So Caitlin was one of the kids who, um, you know, wanted lots of friends. Um, and she says, I make sure that almost every music club, basketball, you know, anything that's available, I make sure she gets into, into it to help her. And church and parties, I try to take her out as much as I can. And then we have a parent about Kieran. So I just pushed him last year to invite children home to play. And then this year I thought, no, maybe he don't want to get a friend. I don't know. I, can, I can't push him too hard to get a friend. He might be upset, like if I'm saying all the time, oh, haven't you got a friend? Just bullying him all the time. And this really brings me to my point. Um, all, of the all of the teachers and all of the parents um, were, wanted these children to be included in the classroom, to be included in social networks with their non-autistic peers and did everything they possibly could to make that happen. So that's either facilitating children in, um, or um, interactions in the playground or getting kids to um, go into groups after school. Um, but that's not necessarily what the children wanted. So that's not, that's not what Kieran wanted. 
And that's also not what Eleanor wanted. So this is um, a parent about Eleanor. I tried doing brownies with her and it was just too painful for her. She had to sit in a circle and talk and she just hated it. And then another one about Daniel, you know, sometimes I just want to play by myself. So there were clear, um, and this about, again is about the variability, um, but there were clear instances where you know, children just did not want to act, interact with other children. So just to summarise, um, primary school age children with autism can and do form friendships and are part of classroom social networks within mainstream schools. They seem to have a different understanding of what actually constitutes friendship, so which, which relies more on kind of this notion of friends as companions, someone to play with, someone to chat to, hang out with, rather than someone to, to be intimate with or to kind of strike up that you know, really rich emotional bond with. And while they're generally satisfied with their friendships, their desire for social contact seemed to play a role in their nature and degree of their friendship. So that, you know, their, mot their motivation to have and make, you know, make and keep friends was kind of, was seen to be the driving force behind how well they were included in the classroom and also how well satisfied they might be with, those, with their, um, with their um, peer interactions. Some children felt overwhelmed by the expectations of having constantly to engage with other children. Um, and that was particularly the case with Daniel, who he, he just said, I, sometimes I just want to play by myself. So he'd been in, in school, in the classroom, you know, for, you know, before lunchtime and before playtime, and then gets to lunchtime, he doesn't want to have to interact with anyone. He just kind of wants to chill out. Um, so there's this feeling of overwhelmness. Um, and although adults were sensitive to these concerns, they still, parents and teachers still felt compelled to encourage children with autism to socialise with other children. And in effect, to kind of make them appear normal. And I think this raises quite subtle, but what I think are nevertheless quite serious social and ethical issues about when and how to intervene with these children. So we, as parents, as teachers, as non-autistic people, you know, want, want, want autistic people to be part of our social world and we'll do anything we can in order to try and give them the same sorts of opportunities as maybe our non-autistic you know, um, individuals do. Um, and that might be, again, facilitating um, um, you know, classroom interactions or um, you know, encouraging kids to go to groups but that's not maybe, you know, some children might well want that, but others might not. And in fact, in some cases, um, if, we, if we do those things, we might actually be doing some harm, either, even in the, long, in the short term or, or in the longer term. So, you know, just, even just thinking about the, um, you know, facilitating the interactions in the playground, you know, if, you, if, you, if the children are effectively being forced to interact with other children, it might, and they don't want to be, you know, it might make them more anxious, which means when they go back into the classroom, they're not going to learn as effectively because, you know, they're completely wound up. Or, you know, thinking about the, brown, the little girl going to brownies, if, you know, if, if parents were, were, weren't as sensitive and were kind of, you know, um, uh, kept her going in these brownie, um, brownie group, this, I think, might, I mean, she obviously hated it, and if, she, if, she, if that did continue, I think it only serves to make her more aware of her potential differences and might lead to kind of depression and anxiety in the longer term. So I hope what I've shown you um, is that there is this kind of um, this massive variability um, with, in the nature and degree of autistic children's friendships and in the, um, the extent to which children with autism actually want to have friends. Um, and I have two suggestions about this. So that there, there, is, there, is this fine, there is this fine line, so, which I think is a fine line anyway. The, 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 the parents and these teachers were, con were um, essentially what I think, making these ethical decisions every day. So you know, there's this decision where you, you, know, you want the child um, with autism to, to have the skills in order to you know, make and keep friends should they want to in the future. So you want to give them those skills to kind of empower them. But at the same time, you don't want to do that if it, if it causes them distress 
or either in the short term or the longer term. So there's this constant kind of line. And, and, and our parents and, and teachers, I think, were quite sensitive um, to, to this. I hope that actually reflects um, to parents and teachers more broadly. I'm not quite entirely sure it does. Um, but that's a kind of line that, we, that we, I think we always have to negotiate. And so I, I don't have a you know, right answer of what we should do in these situations. But I have two um, suggestions um, that might you know, um, pave the way forward, I think. So the first um, suggestion is engagement. So I think we need, so we must, I think, give autistic young people the opportunity that, to voice their views and perspectives, their kind of hopes and fears, um, especially, uh, especially for those who might, um, who might not be able to communicate um, their hopes or their perspectives so effectively. We need to be able to, um, um, we need to be very um, careful about placing our non-autistic ideals or our non-autistic kind of expectations of what is the right way to intervene with these children. And so therefore the only kind of way to understand what these children want um, or don't want is um, by asking them. And I think we need to, we need to listen. So this is a quick quote from a friend of mine and an autistic self-advocate in the US, Ari Naiman, who says, in the world we live in, disabled people are always just around the corner, but never in the room. So we all we make decisions about ch uh, children with autism, young people, adults with autism, but we often actually don't ask them about what they want. So that's kind of my first suggestion, actually asking these kids how they feel about things. I think we take this for granted in, in, some, in some ways, and um, obviously parents yeah, do this all the time, but I, I think professionals in particular um, aren't very good at, um, at actually ask or eliciting the views and perspectives of, of young people with autism. My second suggestion is to be relational, and this kind of builds on what Neil was talking about, but um, you know, we, again, we, we don't want to um, impose our non-autistic perspectives on, um, on, on individuals with autism. Autistic people rightly demand acceptance, respect and understanding. And I think to deepen our ability to respond to their needs, their individual needs, we first of all need to deepen our relationships or our connections with them. And um, this is a quote from Wendy Lawson, um, who says, focusing upon strengths and, and ability should not take away from areas of, of d difficulty and disability. It simply allows the individuals concerned to access value and respect. We need to understand the kind of the individual capabilities and potential disabilities of, of each child. So they're my two kind of, kind of concrete um, suggestions. One is to, be, uh, to engage children or young people with autism, but the second is to develop strong connections with them. Um, and I think it's only by, by um, uh, developing these sorts of connections that we can be sh sure about if we should intervene and maybe the, pot the potential ways that we should go about that. So thank you, and thank you to all the young people who took part, and their parents and, and, and teachers, um, but particularly to Lindsay Calder, whose thesis, um, this doctoral thesis this was, and my collaborators. Thank you. Thank you.